actually, uh, I really appreciate when uh, invited me to uh, to this to this workshop. Uh, just about the only chance I got to travel these days, so which is all right. I appreciate that. And uh, my contact information is actually on the screen here, uh, Florence, South Carolina. Uh, if anybody been to Florence? I guess not, because every time I ask them, they say, yeah, I heard of Florence before. Did you ever stop? No. <laughs> We're right on I-95, I so people pass by it all the time, but nobody ever stopped. <laughs> so nobody ever come visit me. <laughs> all right, well, actually, what, would you, what we're going to talk about today is actually, uh, actually scale insects. Um, in fact, um, scale insects used to be more of a landscape problem. Uh, but because of the recent economic situation that we have, more and more of us are actually keeping the trees around. The longer we keep it around, the more chance for the scary insects to actually flare up. Typically, scary insects its population takes a few years to develop before you can really see it. If you keep your trees for about two or three years, you might not see anything. But if you keep it longer than that, you're starting to pick something up. All right, uh, in fact, uh, scary insects, are uh, really dear to my heart because uh, I did uh, all my graduate studies on mealybugs uh, and then I worked in uh, Miami for USDA APHIS for a couple of years and worked on mealybug and uh, after I get to uh, 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 Clemson University the biggest thing that I have to deal with scare insects so uh, I've been working on it for quite a few years and really starting to understand what scale insect can really do to us. Uh, of course, there's going to be cost of control. There's material cost involved in insecticides. There's a labor cost that you have to put in. Somebody has to spray it. And then when you are spraying it, you are using some kind of equipment. That's wear and tear. There's some cost right there. And then there's another cost, basically it's cost of damage. Uh, some of the tree, this is a very typical site in a lot of parking lot. Poor insulation. And then tree is not growing. Anybody want to guess how, how, how long that willow oak has been there? 20 years. <laughs> Just about right, 15. It's not growing much at all. Just because it doesn't have any room to grow. So poor insulation, poor growth um, in the nursery and also in the landscape is making scale insect problem even worse. Now scale, of course, can reduce the growth. And if your clients is seeing the scale, most likely they are not going to take it. And that probably brings us to the biggest problem when we deal with scale insects is reject the shipment. Uh, is, is scale insects going to cause a lot of damage in the landscape? Probably but it takes a lot for them to actually, a, long, a very long time to actually do that. But they are pretty visible. Uh, I'll show you some example of that. Uh, well, let's go through some uh, pretty common ones. If you are growing holly a lot of time in South Carolina, holly is one of our bigger crop and uh, we always have to deal with uh, wax scale. Uh, up here, you probably got Indian wax scale, uh, which is a big old gummy kind of in, uh, scales that's feeding on it. If you flip it over, underneath the body itself is actually bright pink or bright red. Uh, one thing that associated with scale insects is that pseudomone. Pseudomone is a big problem. They produce a lot of honeydew, land it on the car, land it on the leaves. It's going to be sticky, it's going to be shiny, very visible. And it's also a great substrate, substrate to grow pseudomone. More and more uh, oak lucanium scale. I've been working on this piece for quite some time now. You're going to see them on any kind of oak, quite common. And also on uh, European fruit lucanium scale, which is a very similar species, we get on just about anything that you grow. Uh, this is a close up of that. And Amy talked about biological control. In fact, scale insects in the landscape and also in the nursery, a lot of them population are suppressed by natural enemies. You probably see a hole right there, and that's a, out of focus, there's a little wasp crawling around. In fact, in most situations, when we deal with old lacanum scale, about 60 to 70% of those scales on the twigs are already dead. It's controlled by the natural enemies. But the natural enemies, the little wasps, can be easily killed by a lot of things. So I'll talk about it a little bit more. Now this is what happened a tree uh, uh, scale insect can do. This is actually right outside of my office. Uh, this tree has about no scales on it. That one has a lot of scale, 3.1 scales per centimeter. And that has 1.8 scales per centimeter. Same location, same soil type, planted at the same time. 
Uh, maybe a little bit genetic differences in the liners, but maybe it's very little. But as you can see, the one have the most scales look the worst. The one that don't have any scale look pretty good. Now that picture was taken in 2006, 2008 actually. So I say, wow, that's a great tree. And lo and behold, um, it's uh, mm, it's going. Ah. As soon as I say it's a good tree, a lightning strike it and kill it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you have a certain tree you want to kill, I could do the service for you. <laughs> Not a problem. All right, another soft scale, uh, calico scale. You guys probably seen that once in a while up here. Down in South Carolina, I don't really see it at all. Uh, this is a close-up of that. Uh, another pretty common one, cottony maple scale. Uh, this one, this particular one is on a dogwood, but it could get on vib viburnum and just about anything you can think of. Um, even though it's called maple leaf scale, the host range is quite, uh, uh, quite wide. And this is a close-up of it. This particular species, that's a female itself. Those white stuff are actually the waxy uh, ovi sac. Inside those sacs are probably hundreds of eggs that's hanging in there. So this is the uh, maple leaf scale. This is a cottony maple scale. This is a different species, but related. This particular species do not lay eggs underneath the leaves. They lay eggs on the twigs, but they look very, very similar. Uh, let's look at some uh, armor scale. This is the uh, obscure scale. Probably one of the biggest scale, armor scale problem we have on oak trees in South Carolina. Uh, pretty hard to uh, tell what they are because a lot of times they feed on the trunk and they just look like little pimples on the trunk. If you're not looking very carefully at it, you're not going to know what you're dealing with. The biggest problem for South Carolina, maples in the landscape are the gloomy scales which is a related species to obscure scale. These guys will feed on the new growth of the maple, basically kill that new growth. And you can go to South Carolina, and in fact, North Carolina and further down, you look at every single maple trees in the landscape, you are gonna find these guys. And right now, we don't really have a good solution for them. This is what happened to it. You're gonna have hundreds of scale, thousands of them hanging all over the place like that. Euonymus scale, uh, some of you probably quite familiar with that. Uh, that's the uh, close-up, that's a female right there. But the one that you draw your attention are actually the males. These are the white, white ones with fluffy uh, test, fluffy uh, uh, shell, three ridges. Those are the most uh, obvious ones. So basically in, in production and also in landscape, when we deal with scale insects, two groups are the biggest one, the soft scale and the armor scale. Um, so that, there is actually a very good reason to actually distinguish whether you have a soft scale or you have an armor scale, if you cannot de de determine the species. Because the two groups of scale insects are very different when it comes to control. When, you, when we are thinking about neonicotinoid, systemic insecticide, it can knock the soft scale off pretty easy, kill it pretty easy. <coughs> but systemic neonicotinoid doesn't work that well on armor scale. And you have to come back with, with a different kind of approach, different kind of insecticide, or different kind of uh, management approach to deal with that. Okay, so it's a little bit different between the two groups, so it would make sense to actually distinguish what they are. And there are several dif different characteristics that you could use to actually distinguish soft scale from armor scale. Um, the first thing is what I call a pin, pin test, P-I-N, pin test. What you do is get a little pin, stuck it underneath the scale, and flip it over, okay? Soft scale, when you flip it over, the body and the cover, they don't separate at all. They flip over as one piece. Armor scale, on the other hand, when you flip it over, the shell and the body will separate. In that way, you can tell which one is soft scale, which one is armor scale. Ah, that's an example. That's a soft scale. That's the armor scale. As you can see, armor scale, the body is right there. That's the shell. Flip it over, they separate, you got armor scale. Flip it over, the body and the shell stuck together. 
That's a soft skill, simple. Another characteristic to, uh, to separate soft scale from armor scale is honeydew. Okay, soft scale produce honeydew, armor scales don't. The reason is soft scale feed on the phloem, feed on the juice of the plant. The juice is a high volume of juice, but there's not a lot of nitrogen inside that juice. So what does the soft scale really wanted are the nitrogen or the amino acid. So they will filter out the amino acid, but they still got a lot of plant juice. Well, so they get rid of it from the, from the rear end. <laughs> and when they do that, that's what we call honeydew. But armor scale, they feed in a different way. Armor scale do not feed on the phloem system. They actually feed on cells, individual cells, one at a time. All right, so they don't produce any honeydew at all. So honeydew, well, not very good pictures, but you can see this is a holly, and uh, if it's black, it's honeydew. That's what happened. And this is a very common um, armor scale species we have in South Carolina. It's called the uh, magnolia white scale or the false oriental scale. You see those yellow line? That's where the feeding part of the armor scale actually been to. So the feeding tube of that armor scale just do it one cell at a time. As it empty one cell, that cell become silvery, become uh, yellowish. So you can actually trace where the uh, mouth part actually been to. So that's why armor scale, because they don't feed on the phloem system, they don't produce hum honeydew. Okay, so everybody clear about armor scale, soft scale? Very good. Now, um, I mentioned that management approach for the two group of scale insects is a little bit different. So I'm gonna use uh, two examples to illustrate that point. Um, calico scale, we use that as a uh, soft scale, example for the soft scale, and Japanese maple scale as an example for the armor scale. Because I believe calico scale is what you guys deal with quite a bit, especially in the nursery production. And you should look out for Japanese maple scale. So take that as an example to uh, uh, give you some education on that. Um, let's talk about calico scale first. In fact, most of the study on calico scale is done by that guy. Most of you probably know who he is, Dan Potter. Uh, in fact, uh, and many of the students working on uh, calico scale and other scale insects before. In fact, Sarah sitting there uh, is a student of Dan. And Dan has done most of the study on calico scale, and so I'm, most of my presentation is actually based on what he find out. All right, let's look at the uh, life cycle of the calico scale. We start with the adult female down here in the bottom. The adult female, pretty easy to tell if you have a calico scale or not, black and white, easy enough. And when you have the calico scale, that's a female. The adult female, they usually swell up really quickly within a few weeks in April. And it's usually during this time that the adult female actually produce a lot of honeydew. And that's when you actually see a lot of honeydew showing up. Uh, so if you see honeydew, it would be a good indication for some kind of sucking insect. So lift the, the leaves underneath or look at the twigs above it. You might actually see a scale, a white fly, or some kind of aphids. All right, so the adult female swelled up in April and starting to produce eggs. And the eggs hatch in mid late May. And at that time, the little, craw the little hatchlings, that's what we call crawler, starting to crawl all over the place. They can also catch a wind and fly to a new plant. But on the plant itself, they crawl over the place. And when they find a suitable heat fit, they'll move up the twigs all the way to the leaf and start, start settling along the leaf vein right there. When they settle, they start feeding, and that's it. And then they start, they, they feed, and they produce a lot of honeydew, and then they move to a second star, and that the whole uh, uh, time between May and October, they'll feed on the leaf, and by about October, they'll move back onto the twig. Just before the leaves actually drop off the tree, they move onto the twigs to overwinter as a second star. And then in April, they become adult female again, and the cycle continues. Okay, now, one thing I want to mention, like Amy mentioned earlier, try not to remember all these dates, because from year to year to year, they might be a little bit different. 
the development of insects is depending on temperature. If you have a high temperature, like the warm winter we have this year, the, SL, the, the development may be accelerated. Uh, Japanese beetles. In South Carolina, the emergence of sad Japanese beetles is about two weeks earlier this year. They last because we have a warm, warm winter. So um, the same thing is uh, with the scale insects. All right, eggs. Uh, each female calico scale produces 3,700 to 4,500 eggs, each one. And uh, so you can see the potential for population to explode is very, very high. Even though most of these eggs and most of these corals do not survive to next year, but there's still a pretty good chance that they'll do very well. Now the eggs, when they first laid, usually kind of creamy, but as they age, they become kind of pinkish. <coughs> Right, this is a good colony of calico scale. The live one and the dead one are pretty easy to tell. The live one are usually kind of shiny, round, black and white. When they get old, these are the, these are the female from last year, this turn brown. So pretty easy to tell. And also after your treatment, if they die, they also turn brown. So this would be a good characteristic for you to actually determine whether you actually have an active infestation or whether your control is actually working by looking for these brown scales. Host plan for the calico scales is a long list. Um, let's see, you got anything that probably grown in your nursery is right on it. Uh, hackberry, got quite a few, honey locust, maple, uh, salcovia definitely, sweet gum, tulip tree. And these guys are all susceptible to calico scales. So if you are doing any kind of scouting at all, probably start with all these plants and focus on them. All right, monitoring for calico scales. Um, the uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, which is when we think about managing scale insects, the most important stage you want to control are the crawlers because the crawlers do not have any kind of wax on their body. The female, she has a thick wax and also a shell on the body. And that wax, any kind of insecticide you spray is not gonna penetrate that wax. But the crawlers do not have any wax at all. So if you spray even just horticulture oil, you can kill them very easy, as long as it's landed on the body. So uh, when we talk about scale insects management, we also target, always target crawlers. So we need to know exactly when to scout. Uh, focus on scouting for the crawler emergence. For the calico scale in, in Kentucky, typically mid to late May. That would be the time for you to actually start thinking about doing that. Uh, where do you look? Look into the branches, particularly the branches. Look for the female. Um, if you have the female there, you might want to think about it. And then look for the honeydew and the pseudimo because as I say, the female will produce a lot of honeydew. If you see the honeydew, look at the branches, look at the leaves and see if you can find anything on that. Uh, to find them, visual inspection, pretty important. How many of you have hand lens? Most of you, I hope, because this is a very important too. Everywhere I go, I try to have this uh, with me I guess my eyesight is not that great. I can't see the little crawlers. <laughs> Just like that, I can't even see it. So, hand lens is very important. So you use the hand lens to look at twigs, look at the leaves, and see if you can find the, the scale. Uh, you can use a double-sided sticky tape. Uh, Amy showed you the picture of that. You could do it, just wrap around the twigs. They'll get stuck. And there's another, chem there's another um, thing that you could use is called tangle food. Tangle food is a very sticky substance that you can apply onto the twigs. I don't like tangle food because that once you apply it, it stay on, stay on the twigs forever. And somebody touch it, it's gonna get stuck. Your hair got it, it's gonna get in your hair. You have to cut it off and that's not fun. <laughs> and, and also there are other methods to actually monitor for calico scales emergence. The one thing is degree day. How many of you are familiar with degree days? Used to be. Used to be, uh-huh. Well, uh, very quickly, degree day, like I say, insect development, 
depends on temperature. So you can actually measure temperature and accumulate them as a unit until a certain unit is accumulated then you know that's when a specific life stage of an insect or plant is going to happen and for the crawler emergence of calico scales you have to accumulate about 1400 degree day use a base temperature of 40 degree Fahrenheit uh, for the crawler emergence if you do that if you cal uh, calculate that then you know that will give you indication that uh, the crawlers are emerging you might want to think about um, doing something about that and there's quite a few different uh, sources uh, degree day calculators out there I personally use USPass.org calculators quite a bit because it gives me a 30 year history um, so I can actually predict what's going to happen this year what's going to be happen next year um, using those uh, using this information up here uh, for your purposes and ease of using, you can go to just weather channel, weather.com, and in their search uh, search uh, category, just type in growing degree days, they'll pop it right out. In fact, the uh, weather channel uh, growing degree day calculators is very good. All you need is entering your uh, the name of your city, the base temperature. When do you want to start? Usually, you start accumulating January first. And then when you want to stop, it would spit out exactly how many degree days has been accumulated in that year. Okay, so we'll give you a pretty good indication. So when you get to about 1400 degree day, you want to think about controlling calico scale. Okay. Another way, uh, Sarah. Do you mind if I add one more thing? Sure. Um, I've noticed that with the calico scale, in that picture you have on the <coughs> slide with the white and black healthy live scale mm -hmm. versus the ones that are brown and dying. The crawler emergence typically happens right around the time that the adults just start to turn brown. Um, so that's also kind of an easy thing to look for. Good point. Everybody heard that? Sarah said that, well, another point, another way to actually tell when the uh, crawlers are emerging is when the adult female is starting to turn brown. So that would be another good indication of when it's happening. Thanks, sir. All right, another way to tell when the crawlers are coming out is to look at what is flowering around you. Same thing with uh, insects. Plants, plants are phenological event is also related to temperature. Same thing, they have to accumulate certain amount of heat, certain amount of heat unit before something is going to happen. So for crawler emergence, um, then part of the study basically look at that and say, okay, here are some of the indicators. When your oak leaf hydrangea is starting to bloom, look for that. Or your northern Catawba, about 50% of the flowers already open. And Washington Hawthorn, about 50% of the flowers open. So when those plants are starting to flower, or 50% of the plants are flowering, then you should go out there and look for the scale insects. And that's about the time when the crawlers are coming out. So pretty good indication right there. So save me the trouble of going online and go through all the web <coughs> and go through all the apps on uh, all the advertisement on weather.com before I can get to that uh, degree day calculations. But this is also very good. All right, let's talk about control for the calico scale. Uh, cultural control, pretty important. Amy mentioned that, look at your liner. If there's something on it that you don't like, you better send it back. Um, that's always good to keep it clean instead of fixing the problem later on because they're much more difficult. If the infestation, if you cannot return it, the infestation is not too bad, print it up. Or if the plant is already in your, in, in your nursery, and the infestation is not too bad, print it up. If it's just one twig that have, the, that have the problem, no problem. If it's just one calico scale, squish it. Easy enough. No, you don't have to spray of everything. And spraying is not that cheap. All right, if it is very heavily infested, instead of spraying for it, I would say, hmm, you know, I might want to think about uh, putting it to the fire. 
because if you want to spray over and over and over again, consider your labor cost, your material cost, it's going to be quite expensive. Uh, if you could do it, you could do that. Now, discarded material, the thing that you cut down, like I say, is probably best to burn it. And also, uh, summer solstice is coming up. If you want to save them up for a bonfire, that's perfectly good. And just kumbaya around it, and everybody's happy. All right, one important thing about cultural control is keep your plant healthy. Uh, Amy mentioned that before. Plant it at the right place. Keep it happy. Pro proper fertilization, proper irrigation. Healthy plant could actually withstand infestation a lot better than a stressed plant. Biological control, there's quite a few things out there. Um, the Dan study and look at it, and they identify about 14 species of parasitoid in, in Kentucky that would attack calico scale. Um, most of them are the uh, cocophagus, uh, and carcia, and the metaphagus. This is one, one, one of those parasitoid. These guys are tiny. Okay, one sixteenth of an inch, they're about pretty tiny. And there's a lady beetle species that's out there that's also feeding on the calico scale. It's a black and white uh, hyperaspis species. Um, but you would say, okay, um, we have all these natural enemies. Can I get them, buy them, and then release them in my nursery? Unfortunately, no. Um, at this point, there's not any commercial production of those parasitoid or lady beetles. Uh, you could, for your some other pests, you might want to think about biocontrol if you could do it. it it's going to be very difficult because it's going to involve a lot of labors, a lot of time, and it's a very, very steep learning curve. But the good thing is, some of the bigger biocontrol agent suppliers like Cobert or Biobest or Syngenta BioLine, they usually have very, very good technical um, advice. You're not just buying them, buying it from them and release it you're almost buying an entire package. They're sending the people, they'll give you the information on how to release it, when it's best to release it, where it's best to release it, and such. But um, for calico scale right now, this kind of augment, this kind of release control is not quite there. So, uh, kind of have to depend on what's around. Uh, they, are, they are all over the place, they are kind of free, they come in, they take care of it, but there are certain conditions to be met before they can do their job. The first thing is really important, which is to avoid using the broad spectrum insecticide. What I mean by broad spectrum includes things like orthine, tau star, seven, things like that. Things that would wipe everything out. Now, the parasitoid and the lady beetles are very, very sensitive to insecticide. You can kill them first, before you kill the scale. So if you want to keep them around, the first thing to do maybe is to avoid using them. Or use, use the uh, insecticide when the parasitoids are not too active. Another thing would be to provide habitat. Because the habitat would give them shelter, would give them uh, alternative food source, like uh, nectars and pollens and whatnot. Uh, you could grow wildflowers around it, uh, clovers, queen anne lace, things like that. But um, one thing I need to caution everybody about use, using this sort of uh, habitat or alternative food source is that parasitoid, every species of parasitoid has different requirements and we are not quite there yet to actually tell you particularly, specifically what plant would attract what kind of parasitoid. So we're still working on that. Um, you could plant a lot of stuff out there and not everything is going to attract things that you want. So be aware of that. As far as insecticide, uh, there's a long list of different things. I hope nobody's using Saigon anymore. Uh, it might not be there for long. Uh, and also there's uh, quite some uh, insect growth regulators like Proprofacin or Pariproxifen. Um, then also look at this and these are the chemicals that would give about more than 80% of control which is uh, quite decent. Over here you got orthine, tau star, seven, distance. These guys will give you about 80% control if you spray it or uh, when you see the crawlers. Now if you are thinking about um, landscape, when you're thinking about uh, soil drench or granular type of uh, applications, you could probably go with uh, crotianathan or dinotefran. Now crotianathan or arena, uh, that is just for landscape, not for nursery. Okay, so, okay, 
Questions about calico scales? How am I doing on time? I wasn't paying attention. I guess you need to hurry. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. I'll go very quickly about this, Jeff. Sure. At one time, Dr. Potter was recommending one uh, spreader sticker. Mm hmm. Is there anything in, in the research that which of the spreader stickers are the best? Or? I'm not familiar with that. Um, do you know anything, Sarah? Mm -hmm. No, in my... I mean, what, capsule? Yep, it's capsule. In my, in my own research on different kind of scale insects, capsule has always been the uh, spreader stickers that I use because that's the more commonly available one. But I have not compared different kind of... There are, I can think of probably six different kind of stickers right now. I have not compared them all. Uh, but if you have a sticker spreader, it would increase the efficacy, definitely. Any other questions? All right, so let's go with a Japanese maple scale. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand about who has Japanese maple scale. It's a big stigma. But there's a lot of work being done right now in Maryland. And these are the leaders in the uh, research. Paul Shrewsbury, Mike Rob. I don't know what he's eating, maybe a bug. And then uh, Stan and Gill and their students, they're working quite a bit. And there's a lot of new information coming out from Maryland on their on, the, uh, on, 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 on this particular scale species. Now, the Japanese maple scale is an almond scale. It's an oyster-shaped almond scale that's feeding on the trunk and also on the branches. But when the population is really, really high, they can also feed on the twigs. This is a pretty typical uh, situation when you have really, really, really bad infestation. The twigs look almost gray because of the number of scales that's on there. And this is a close-up of it. This is a female with a brown, uh, brown top and also a white waxy uh, sack in the back. If you wipe off, wipe, wipe off the, uh, the white stuff, underneath it you will see a, a brown shiny skin. Uh, we call it pipirelia. Uh, these things is a pretty good diagnostic tool for you in the field because there are very, very few armor scale species out there that actually have that brown shiny skin underneath the white stuff. So if you wipe it off, you've got that brown stuff, we can almost be sure it is a Japanese maple scale. Just to be more sure about it, you can flip it over. Okay, there we go. Flip it over. If you're lucky, okay, lucky is a perspective word. Now, if, if the female, if it's a, a Japanese maple scale, and if she has eggs, the eggs are going to be purple. There's hardly any armor scale species out there that have purple eggs, other than camellia scale. Camellia scale have purple eggs, but I don't think you're going to see very camellia scales up this way. So basically, if you flip it over, you got purple scale each, you might got Japanese maple scale. Okay, each female probably produce about 25 eggs. And this is a crawler. Uh, picture is actually from uh, Paula's lab, right there. That little guy is going to hatch from the uh, female and then start crawling around and settle. Number of generations is very different whether you are in the north or in the south. In Pennsylvania, there's one generation. In Maryland, uh, two generations. The first generation, the crawlers emerge in early June, and the second generation, the crawlers emerge in late August. Now look at this. This is one problem why Japanese maple scale is so difficult, difficult to control because the crawlers emerge over a two months period. Okay? There's not one insecticide out there that you spray and has two months residual control. So what's going to happen is if you spray it only once at the beginning of the emergence, it will run, it, the residual will wear out before the, the crawler emergence is done. So you're not controlling the tail end of the emergence. So what's going to happen is you have to go in twice, to spray twice, to actually cover the entire emergence period. Now, Tennessee, this, uh, this numbers actually come from Amy's publication. Uh, first generation in mid-May, second generation in early August. Is that about the right? Yeah, okay. Uh, Kentucky, no idea. Uh, no study being done yet. But I think Kentucky is probably very similar to Maryland, about two generations at about the same time. 
So uh, it would be a good idea for you to go out there and think about where you want to look at them. Uh, look at some of the most common host plants. It's again a very, very long list. I bet every single one of you grows something on that list. And, but Acer seems to be one of the ones that's most preferred. If you're growing any kind of Acer, any kind of maple, pay really co close attention to that. But it could be on just about everything. The Gostrum, Elms, Zelkovia, could be anything, okay? So monitoring, again, for a good control program for Japanese maple scale, you want to target the crawlers. So you want to f figure out exactly when they come out. Typically early June or mid-August. And then where you're going to look, look at the plants that's most affected. And also look underneath the deer protection. That's where a lot of time the scale insects actually congregate because they got protected from the environment underneath there. And then the dirt, another place would be a rough area. Uh, kind of the elbow of your plants or some kind of crotch somewhere over there. How you do that? You could do a visual inspection, get real close. Unfortunately, not similar to the uh, calico scale. Calico scale, at least you have honeydew to tell you there's something going on there. Japanese middle scale, not so. You might have some kind of twig die back, but that's already too late. So you have to be very vigilant about that. Probably use a double-sided sticky tape. I think that, that thing will work. It will also trap the crawlers. Now the crawlers are pretty easy to tell, it's purple. So it will show up very well on that tape. Degree day prediction, you could do that as well. And uh, at Maryland, they have done quite a bit of study to look at that. Uh, first generation, the uh, emergence begins at 215 uh, degree day, but it peaks at 1100 degree day. The second generation, it peaks at 2300 degree day. I mean, it begins at 2300 day, uh, degree days, but it peaks on 3700 degree days. So uh, again, remember, the crawler emergence spend about two months period. So that's a lot of, of uh, a lot of time for the crawlers to come out. Uh, when you look at that degree day, you can think of a couple, a couple of management approach. You could spray at the beginning, as soon as the scale come out, you can give it one spray. Three weeks later, give it another spray. Or you can wait until the peak and spray it then, and then three weeks later, spray another time. Either way, you have to spray at least twice. There's no escaping that. And again, these are just the information on degree day calculators, you can use that. And you can use a plant phenological indicator. The first generation crawl come out when the Chinese lilac is in full bloom, common smoke tree is in full bloom, full bloom and also a Japanese stewardia at 50% bloom. That's one indicator. And the second generation indicator, devil's walking stick, when the flower bud is just developing. Okay, so this would, when these plants are showing that kind of phenological event, you might want to think about going out there, put out a sticky trap, or do some kind of visual inspection, and think about management. Skip all that. Uh, biocontrol, in Maryland, there's quite a few study, uh, there, there's quite a few species that have been found, seven species of parasitoid, and a lady beetle called a twice-step lady beetle is a black beetle with two big red spots in the middle, like somebody stabbed it twice. And that's what happened. And chemical control. Um, folks in uh, Maryland has done quite a bit of study on that, and what they find out is that if you are thinking about applying to the trunk or the branches during the crawler's emergence, the insect growth regulator is pretty good. Pariproxifen, Proprofacin, working very well. These guys usually give you about residual of every, maybe two to four weeks. So I would say probably spray every three weeks or so. Now, uh, in South Carolina, when I was working on armor scale of a different species, these guys also showed up to be some of the best material. And the efficacy actually increased if I mix this with horticultural oil. So a mixture of horticultural oil and one of the insect growth regulators actually give you a increased efficacy right there. In the fall or in the winter, you might want to think about uh, dormant oil which is working very well for most of the armor scale control. Uh, remember now, dormant oil is a very heavy, heavy uh, petroleum oil. You don't want to spray anything that has leaves 
or the buds are just breaking. So you want to do it when the plants are in dormancy. As far as soil drench, uh, you could use a Grotianathan, Dinotefran, or Spirotetramat, which is Contos. Now these guys uh, may be best reserved for landscaping business because these things are pretty expensive. Uh, quite a bit of dollars to be spent right there. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it right there. And uh, questions about Japanese maple scale or calico scale or anything at all? All right. Eh. All right, well, I'm just going to go a little bit longer. Now, uh, I've, I've been studying scale insects for quite some time now, and we're starting to try to figure out how most of the insecticide will work on one scale or another. Uh, what we find out is that um, how effective insecticide application is really depends on where the scales, what kind of scales you're dealing with, and where they're feeding. If you're dealing with a scale that actually spend, that feed on the leaves, or spend at least part of the life cycle on the leaves. Now, things that spend on the leaves, for example, uh, red scale as an armor scale, or spend part of the life cycle on the leaves like a calico scale. Now, neonicotinoid works very well on these scale insects. You can do a soil drench, you can do a spray. The thing is, neonicotinoid, a lot of time, I think, they accumulate in the leaf tissue. So the scale insects actually picked up enough of this chemical, enough of the active ingredient to kill them. Now, um, but for the scale insects that's feeding on the twigs or the branches, my experience is neonicotinoid systemic insecticide don't really work. Um, don't really know why, but my guess is as the uh, chemical got soaked up by the, by the root and go up the plant, it really doesn't stay in the trunk and the branches long enough for the scale insects to pick up enough of that active ingredient, ingredient to kill them. So for any kind of scale insects, for example, the Japanese maple scale, the best approach actually is still spraying. Spraying a insect, insect growth regulators or a horticultural oil or a combination of both. So uh, that's why I say it, it's pretty important for you to figure out if you are dealing with a soft scale or armor scale. And also know where they are feeding. Are they feeding on the leaves or are they feeding on the twigs? So it's a lot different. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.